will be in Hosea chapter 7, if you'll turn in your Bibles there. A prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. And it's a good word. Every, every year there's people that die of curable but undiagnosed illnesses. Not every condition is curable or even treatable, but the funny thing is, even when it's in our power to avoid or to manage a potentially life-threatening problem, we can be slack about it, right? We're like, well, I know I shouldn't eat that, but, and we, we do anyway, or uh, before I was a youth pastor, I worked with asbestos, um, and it was California law that you needed 40 hours of classroom training and some on-the-job training before you worked with that material because we were all informed about the undeniable health hazards of breathing asbestos fibers. And though we all had the training, we all knew what the state-of-the-art methods were, how to encapsulate it, how to protect ourselves from it, on every job that I ever worked, there were always people that ignored the rules. They just... They knew it was bad to, to, they would be smoking cigarettes in containment. And they say that, uh, they would tell us how much risk it adds to working with asbestos if you also smoke. But people, uh, some legends of the trade, would actually cut a hole in their mask to smoke <laughs> while in containment. And we're like, whoa, what a legend. But really, how dumb, how silly could you be? The northern kingdom of Israel, they could be compared to someone who knew the danger of breathing asbestos, but they just did it anyway. They didn't care. Uh, rebellion from God led to grave problems. And unlike asbestos-related diseases, which are irreversible and uncurable, there was healing and restoration. If the people would return to the Lord, if they would confess their sins, if they would choose to put aside their idolatry and say, God, we need you and worship him only. There was hope. There was restoration for them. But they were like someone who was dying of emphysema but kept chain smoking or someone who was at grave risk of a heart attack and their diet was just double bacon cheeseburgers every day. Like they were not taking heed to what God was saying. He was warning them. But they kept doing the same things that led to their condition. They were to blame for their bad spiritual health because they had departed from the Lord and they refused to listen to him. They refused to seek him. They justified their sin. And we can also be foolish like this because people haven't changed. Thankfully, God hasn't changed and there's hope for us in him. There is hope for salvation. There is hope for restoration. But it's only in him. It's not in anything this world can offer. Hosea 7, starting in verse 1. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, for they have committed fraud. A thief comes in, a band of robbers takes spoil outside. They do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own deeds have surrounded them. They are before my face. They make a king glad with their wickedness, and princes with their lies." God's intention was to heal Israel. He wanted to see them restored, but instead of repenting, they practiced their sin publicly. They did it right out in the open. If you've ever done repair work on a house, you know that when you start taking things apart, there's additional work that's often required. Uh, I've had a similar experience with surgery. The scan showed that there was some damage that warranted surgery, but it wasn't until the incision was made and opened up where they're like, wow, there's, there's more here than what we thought. We were just going to sew, but we're going to use mesh instead. Um, God was not caught off guard by the, the depth of depravity or the moral decay that had happened in Israel, that it was like dry rot that had taken a board and made it totally unsuitable, that it was... Uh, totally destroyed because of the shrines and even a temple to Baal in Samaria. The kingdom, as we see in history, it was riddled with upheaval and failed treaties, assassinations, 
Foreigners sapped them of wealth, defeats, sieges. I mean, you go through the northern uh, kingdom of Israel and it's a very checkered and troubled country. Kings, priests, and people, they were guilty of fraud and theft. So God's like, I'm going to return that upon your own head. The thieves will come in. The, uh, the problems will increase. God says, my people don't consider. They don't think that I actually know what's going on. I recognize what they're plotting. I'm fully aware of the things that they're doing. They forgot about the lies they told, but God didn't forget. He allowed them to be deceived because of their lies. And they would be cut off from help and from hope. And sin would become like a cage that ensnared them. In this chapter, we'll see a lot of similes that are employed to reveal the condition of what had happened to the nation. And it's good for us to try on these similes for size, like Cinderella, right? She, her identity was known because she was the only one that could wear the glass slipper. Apparently, she had small feet, right? So they're like, I don't know, this girl that I, the prince was like, where's this girl that I danced with? I don't know who she is. Well, whoever wears that slipper, that's the one we're looking for. And so we can try on each of these similes for size and say, does it have a bearing in my life? Is there any reality here? Because even if it's not true in your life right now, it's a potential. And also we can use the wisdom of God when we come in contact with our brother and sister who is struggling, when we're struggling, and recall this to mind. I don't want to be like these things, like dry rot timber that has to be totally removed. Um, the scripture says, those who think they stand, take heed lest you fall. Walking with the Lord today doesn't prevent me from stumbling or falling in the future. Everyone who fell from grace once was standing. They were standing at one point, and now they're disgraced because they departed from the Lord. Pride always comes before a fall. Verse 4, they are all adulterers. Like an oven heated by a baker, he ceases stirring the fire after kneading the dough until it is leavened. In the day of our king, princes have made him sick, inflamed with wine. He stretched out his hand with scoffers. They prepare their heart like an oven. While they lie in wait, their baker sleeps all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. They are all hot like an oven and have devoured their judges. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls upon me. Adultery is a common theme found throughout the book. It was spiritual adultery that caused the people to engage in uh, adultery against their spouses, disobedience to God, uh, pursuit of idols. So a departure from God led them into all kinds of sin. And he compared adulterers here to ovens heated by a baker. And the concept of burning with lust, it's seen throughout the Bible. Now, ovens in Hosea's day were quite different than ours that are convection. You just turn them on. Like, if you were going to be baking bread, you would need to prepare the oven long in advance. You would want to, you'd have to cut the wood, uh, and it would be sometimes a pit with some pottery over it, and you'd bake on top of the pottery, or a pit that had, it was round, and you would actually bake your bread on the walls of it, and you would turn it over. And if you've ever done smoking or barbecuing with charcoal, you know that there's some prep time needed. And uh, the baker, he got the wood ready, but then he stopped tending the wood while he was allowing the dough to rise. And then one that once the dough had risen, then it would go into those embers and it would be ready at the right cooking temperature. But Unlike a wise baker, it's like they were adding fuel to the fire. They were stirring up those embers, and it says they were uh, inflamed with alcohol. So they were drunk, they were drinking, they were stirring up those embers. It's like they stoked their lust at night, and but when morning came, it was a bonfire. It was unfit for cooking. And their lust for power, greed, control, it, it led to disgrace, uh, assassination of kings, all manner of trouble. Have you guys ever gone camping and enjoyed a fire under the stars? I was quite surprised as a kid when we'd go camping and we'd wake up in the morning and it's freezing cold and it looked like the fire had totally gone out. 
But if you would stir those embers and add a log, man, the fire would just come right back. It's like, wow, all night those embers just stayed there. It looked like it was out, but it was still hot. Like we were warned, don't step on that. Don't play with that. That's hot and dangerous. It's really a good picture of our flesh because when we expose ourselves to fuel to the fire, if there's lustful images or thoughts, uh, that stirs up desire. It's like kindling those embers. It's adding fuel to the fire. When we have opportunity and corrupt influences, those can converge and with a desire in our hearts that leads to acting out on sin. See, the sin is there. There is part of our flesh that that is always going to be contrary to God. And that's why it's a battle to walk in the Spirit. Because the flesh is wanting to go its own way. And the world is influencing us to go its way. We, we have this natural inclination towards sin. And it's only through Christ that we have a new heart and a new mind and new desires. Matthew Henry wrote this, So these wicked people, when they have formed a design for the gratifying of some covetous or unclean lust, have their hearts so fully set in them to do evil that, though they may stifle them for a while, yet the fire is still glowing within. And as soon as there is an opportunity for it, their purposes break out into overt acts as a fire flames out when it has vent given it. It struck me that this is not the way that I hear people speak today where it's really a stretch to say anything is wickedness. But he says, these wicked people. It's almost like Bible bashing in our culture to suggest that there is a deed that's a wicked deed or an evil deed or that someone is wicked. In Matthew Henry's day, um, those who did what God declared wicked, they, they were wicked. They just, like if you tell lies, you're a liar. And if you do what's wicked, then... You are, you are not only doing wickedness, but you are wicked. And uh, we've, we've almost believed the lie that we're good people who make mistakes. We're really good, but the Bible says the opposite, that we are wicked, we are evil, and it's only through being born again and having a new life through Jesus Christ that we can be washed clean. But notice the broad definition the scriptures give to that word, wicked, because you may say, okay, other people may be wicked, but not me. Well, this is, a, this is one of the biblical definitions in Psalm 10.4. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. So it's not just what you're doing that's wicked, but the fact of what you're not doing. You're not seeking God. That is wickedness, to not seek God. And that's shocking when you think about that. God is in none of his thoughts. God does not enter into the thought of that person. And that's us a lot of the time. Uh, we can forget about God. That's what God said of his people. He says, they don't seek me. He says, none among them calls upon me. So if that's the measure of wickedness, then I have to own that and say, yes, Lord, in my natural sense that I am, I own that. That is, that really, that is a pretty good description of me. Um, but praise the Lord. I've encountered seasons when God has made me aware of my sin through exposure to scripture. When you read something, you say, oh, that's a problem? I didn't really know that was a problem. I thought that was just okay. Uh, where I felt convicted or guilt. And many times I resembled that burning oven where you sow to the flesh and of the flesh reap corruption. And it's like I would work hard to extinguish the flames, to close the vents, uh, to cut off oxygen, to remove sinful temptations or influences from my life. But it was all willpower. It was all me trying to fight against something that if given vent, it was still there. It never went away. And so it was kind of a battle over, over a period of time. And for a long time, I was disappointed over an apparent slip up seeing it as a moment of weakness rather than that's my that's where i'm at that's the reality that's not the exception that's the thing i need to confess instead of being disappointed over it i need to be broken for my sin and the lord brought me to that breaking point over several occasions and different sins 
And when we confess our sins, the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's like those fires, those sinful lusts, they can be extinguished by the living water of the Holy Spirit who now flows out of us. So this battle, this back and forth, this trying to stifle something that's still there when it comes into contact with the temptation, the Lord can give us a new heart and new desires. I mean, that's what we want, right? We want to please God. We want to do the things that honor and glorify him. And that's why it says in James 5.16, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So there's this humbling of ourselves before even our brother or our sister or our spouse to say, I am struggling. This is an area where I am falling. And if we're unwilling to do that, then how are we really humbling ourselves before the holy, almighty God? I was reading today in uh, Micah where it says, like, he steps up, his presence comes to the mountain and it just melts like wax. Like, wow, that is pretty amazing. Like, I don't know anything that can survive lava, but God's presence, like, turns dirt to lava. Just, it just melts before him. And may our hearts melt before him realizing that he is our healer. He comes so that he can restore us and heal us. Verse 8, Ephraim has mixed himself among the peoples. Ephraim is a cake unturned. Aliens have devoured his strength, but he does not know it. Yes, gray hairs are here and there on him, yet he does not know it. And the pride of Israel testifies to his face, but they do not return to the Lord their God, nor seek him for all this. Under the law, God had told his people not to mix with marriages with foreign nations because it would cause them to depart from God. He says, if you intermarry, you're going to make alliances with these families, with these tribes outside Israel, and they're going to lead you away from me. And also, there were other reasons that they would have these marriages where children were raised, where both mom and dad feared God, they'd raise their children to fear him and walk in his ways, and that the inheritance of land would be passed down within that family. It would stay within the tribe. But Israel forsook that covenant. They disregarded it, and they intermarried with all these surrounding nations. And these forbidden alliances, it caused God to compare them to a cake unturned. The cakes that they made, they more resembled like a pancake than what we would call a cake. They didn't have convection ovens. Again, uh, those cakes needed to be turned over. If you've ever tried to cook food over an open fire, you know that it needs to be stirred. It's not long before that bottom starts getting scorched. If a cake remained unturned, it would be burnt to carbon on one side, and it would be raw on the other. It's basically a ruined meal. And I look forward to hearing about your ruined meal experiences. Um... You've, you forgot to turn the heat off on a pot, left the house, came back an hour or two later, and there were charred contents, and you're like, wow, that did not go well. My attempt to make dinner was a failure. It's, it's one thing if we forget to set a timer, but it's another thing if the thing that tells us we forgot is that acrid smell, the smoke alarm going off, and realizing like that was a waste, not salvageable. Sometimes you can salvage a meal. Right? You, you put in the wrong things, you're able to change the seasoning, add to it, take some of it, but this was unsalvageable. There was nothing. It was like, all right, that's a waste. We're going, we're going out to eat tonight. Has that ever happened to you? Hmm. You're like, it wasn't, there was an attempt, and I can still smell it days later. That pot, it's toast. It's not going to ever work again. Um. And Ephraim, it says, it was not like a cake unturned. It says Ephraim is a cake unturned. So metaphor, saying that's what they are. It's just wasted because of their idolatry and sin. It said that their marital connections with people who didn't fear God, it led to foreigners sapping them of their strength. And it was like years of walking away from God had not been kind to Israel. They were like a person who had given the prime of their lives to the abuse of drugs and alcohol and, 
you know, they were all sucked up and the lines were deep and they had these hard experiences. And, and their decline, they didn't see it. They didn't realize that their decline was so great, that they had become so weak, that they had been getting old. Um, but God saw that. Twice, it says here, they didn't even know how weak or vulnerable they had become. It says, hey, they're, they've lost their strength. They don't know it. They've got gray hair everywhere. They have no idea. <laughs> they haven't noticed. They imagined they were fit as ever, but it was just flab. Like, they thought that they were pleasing God, but they really, they were not healthy spiritually. They were self-deceived. Proverbs 20, verse 6, it says, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? Years ago, I had a coworker who started using street drugs, and uh, the euphoria made him feel like a superhero. He thought that he was the most attractive, the strongest, the best invincible version of himself. But ice plays with your mind. It is ravaging the body. It is ruining you, but your mind is tricked to think that you're okay. And you're on top of the world and nothing can bring you, bring you down. So unless we seek God, pride lies to us and we believe it. We fall for it. We, we don't notice any better. As believers filled with the Spirit, we, the, the theology we hold, the promises of Scripture, they have little relevance to our lives if we depart from following Jesus Christ. If we're not seeking the Lord, if we're not following him, if we're not in fellowship with other believers, then we are weak as anyone else, like Samson. Here's a man filled with the Holy Spirit. He had supernatural physical strength. He judged Israel for decades. His strength was legendary, but he gave his strength to sexual sin and vice. He sought the company of prostitutes among the Philistines. Delilah was one of his favorites. And the Philistines knew this, and they paid her to say, find out where his strength lies. We need to know the secret of his strength. Three times he lies to her. And she says, tell me, what, what do we need to do to bind and afflict you? This is not the kind of person you want to be hanging out with. But he keeps hanging out with her, and he, he humors her. He, he tells a lie. He's like, oh, yeah, if you just you know, tie me with new ropes that have never been used, I'll be weak like anybody. And she did it. And then he, this charade kept happening time after time. And finally, it says she kept pestering him till he finally said, all right, I'll share you my whole heart. If my hair is cut, I'll be weak as anyone else because my strength comes from God. And so it says she lulled him to sleep on her knees. She called for the barber, cut off his hair. Judges 16, 20, it says, And she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. Who departed from who? It says God departed from Samson, but who departed a long time ago? Samson had departed from the Lord. And so in that moment of need, when he just assumed the strength of God would be his to draw upon at his convenience, he didn't have strength that day because God departed from him. And this is what sin does. It, it it lures us with pleasure. It lulls us into a false sense of security. But its aim is always to overpower and enslave. And that's what happened to Samson. It was pride that made him senseless of his need for God and his need to walk in God's ways. And he imagined that God would always be there for him when he had departed from the Lord. And he didn't even know. That, that one is always, wow, that's, that's scary. Where it says he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. He had no idea. Let's take heed because none of us are immune to sin's effects that make us weak and vulnerable. 
when we depart from the Lord. That's why we're called to repent, to come back to the Lord, to seek him. Verse 11, Ephraim also is like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. Wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I will bring them down like birds of the air. I will chastise them according to what their congregation has heard. He compares Ephraim here, the northern uh, kingdom of Israel, to a silly dove without sense. Now, I have very remedial knowledge of birds. I'm not quite the bird watcher. But in my limited experience, I have found that doves, I would put them among the dumbest of birds that I have witnessed. Just because when I was a kid, I'd climb trees and I'd be looking for those bird nests. And there were some that were like really well made. Well, doves' nests are not well made. And they're not in good places. They're not in the tops of the trees. They were low, sometimes on the ground. And I'm like, that is no good. What are these doves thinking? Like a couple of pine needles and... Like, how do the eggs even stay? It's so flat and so, like, like, I'm always amazed at the things God has created to, like, build a nest, to weave a web, the things that, things we see in nature. But I could almost make a dove's nest, almost. Not quite, but I'm, it, it's not impressive. <laughs> Ephraim was like a senseless dove which called to Egypt and went to Assyria. We could... Calling to help from Egypt, it's kind of like going back to the old life. Before God had ever revealed himself to them as a nation and delivered them from bondage, why would they want to go back to the place where they were enslaved? Had they forgotten the cruelty of their taskmasters? The oppression they suffered there? That their kids were killed? How could they forget what Egypt was like? And how much it, it wounded them. And they cried out to God to get us out of here. Because of this oppression. And the violence. In their desperation they forgot both the God who saved them. And what he saved them from. They just forgot about it. And instead of seeking mercy from God. They sought to make peace with the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians at this time. They were absolutely brutal in their treatment of um, of their defeated enemies. Mutilation, torture, rape. Uh, they would integrate people to strip them of their culture and their people so they'd have no outside loyalties. They would enslave them. They'd force them under burdens. So trying to make peace with the Assyrians was like trying to uh, make friends with a, a mad dog by petting it. Like it's dangerous. It's not going to pan out well for you. And what was God's response to that desperate flitting to and fro of his people and their aversion to him? It's like they had an aversion to God. They didn't want to draw near to God. They were willing to go back to Egypt. They were willing to make a deal with the devil, with the Assyrians, and, uh, who were bent on destruction and world domination. He says, wherever they go, I will spread my net on them. I am going to catch them. I am going to hunt them down. I am going to preserve them. He wasn't going to destroy them. He says, I'm going to chasten them. I'm going to teach them something. I'm not going to allow them to destroy themselves. I am going to seek them out, and I'm going to catch them. Passages like this remind me of that famous Francis Thompson poem that's titled, The Hound of Heaven. I don't know if you've ever read that one, but I recommend it. It's really cool. It talks about a man who's running from God, but God always, it says, followed after with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy. He's just there, wherever he goes. This man, he looks for satisfaction in romantic relationships, in communing with nature, but he realizes he's getting old. He's past the prime of his youth, and he says, the pulp so bitter, how shall taste the rind? Like my life is so bitter now and, and I see an end coming. What of eternity? How will things be then without God? And this is how the poem concludes, where God finally, the, the man finally stops and God starts speaking to him. 
And he says, all which I took from thee I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. All which thy child's mistake fancies as lost I have stored for thee at home. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Halts by me that footfall. Is my gloom, after all, shade of his hand, outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. How awesome is that? That God in God is what we are looking for. He is the one who has given us life. And he is the one who makes life sweet. The, the love, the peace, the salvation, the hope that the children of Israel were just going to and fro, looking for anywhere they could, that was found only in God. And it's the same for us. May we fly to him. Verse 13, Woe to them, for they have fled from me. Destruction to them, because they have transgressed against me. Though I redeemed them, yet they have spoken lies against me. They did not cry out to me with their heart when they wailed upon their beds. They assembled together for grain and new wine. They rebel against me. Though I discipline and strengthen their arms, yet they devise evil against me. They return, but not to the Most High. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes shall fall by the sword for the cursings of their tongue. They shall, this shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. God pronounced woe on those who fled from him. And he says destruction would be their lot because the soul that sins will surely die. God had brought them out of bondage. He had given them all good things according to his word, but they spoke lies against him. They blamed him for their misfortune. And they justified idolatry. Like, well, serving God's been, we haven't had great results from that, so let's see if there's some other God who will give us what we want. They cried out in their trouble, but not from a heart directed at him. When they gathered on feast days, it wasn't to celebrate him or to observe his goodness, but for the food. It says, they assembled together for grain and new wine. So it was all about the food. It was all about what they were going to get rather than um, praising and worshiping God. And be, It's like they, they gave thanksgiving over the grain and the wine, but not to God who provided the grain and the wine. Their hearts weren't right before God, so their gathering was rebellion. And see how personally God took this. He says, they fled from me. They transgressed against me. They have spoken lies against me. They did not cry out to me. They rebel against me. They devise evil against me. And he compared them to a treacherous bow. Bows, they were made from a flexible wood with a string made of hemp or linen or some natural material. And a bow, an arrow in the hands of a warrior was a deadly weapon. And a treacherous bow, like at Camp Kedron, they have a bunch of bows. Some don't have strings on them. So you wouldn't choose that one if you actually wanted to practice your archery. So you'd look at one and you'd say, this, this looks like it's the big one. Like, I want the big one. I want to be able to shoot it fast. I don't want the little one. So you'd get the right one for the job. And it'd be like the deceitful bows. You draw it back and you're only halfway drawing it. And it just, the string breaks. Or the wood just snaps in pieces. It's like, oh. Now, if you're in the heat of battle, you want your bow not to be a, a treacherous one or deceitful. You want it to be fit and ready for action. And Israel looked like they were fit and ready for action, uh, being God's people, but they weren't. Like a deceitful bow, they fell to pieces. They, they were unreliable, their aim inaccurate, falling short of his standard. Uh, if you turn to Psalm 78, Verse 56, we read what it says about his people. Psalm 78, 56 through 58. It's a very long chapter, and most of it is talking about the wanderings and foibles of God's people. So, another thing to take to heart and say, well... We can't read this and say, I'm glad that's them and not me. Whenever you see a bad example in the Bible, know that it's for you. It's for me. 
We need to listen to it. Psalm 78, 56. Yet they tested and provoked the Most High God and did not keep his testimonies, but turned back and acted unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their carved images. People turned aside from God. Instead of returning to him, they turned aside and went to Egypt. They looked for peace, and so they called out to Assyria. They missed God in their trouble. That's when they needed to, they needed to be looking to God in the midst of trouble and before trouble and after, praising him that he was their deliverer. There's a tragic and somewhat humorous uh, interaction in Jeremiah in Jerusalem. So this happens many years later when the uh, Babylonians were coming and the people didn't want to uh, be defeated. And so in chapter 42, they say, all right, Jeremiah, please inquire of the Lord. What do we do? Whatever God says, we're going to do it. And so he says, okay. He prays, and he comes back to them with a very specific word. He says, do not go to Egypt. Like, anything you do, do not go there. The sword, the famine, the pestilence that you're hoping to avoid, it's going to find you there. Don't go to Egypt. And they said in the next chapter, Jeremiah 43, you're lying, God did not say that. And what did they do? They went to Egypt. It's exactly what they did. But I love that God kept speaking through the prophet. He didn't say, okay, you disregarded my, my command and you've gone to Egypt, so nothing more for you. You're not going to hear a word from me until you do something. No, he loved them and he kept speaking through the prophet. In Jeremiah 44, this is what he says. It's like he kept hounding them. He spread his net over them. Jeremiah 44, 15. Uh, this was the response to God's word to them. Then all the men who knew that their wives had burnt incense to other gods with all the women who stood by, a great multitude, and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros answered Jeremiah saying, As for the word you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. And God kept speaking. I find it amazing that God knew how they would respond, yet he took the time to speak to them. And he does the same for us. Even when we're not in the mood to hear it, he is willing to speak. And he is willing to spread his net to chasten us, to draw us back to himself, to bring us to our senses. And he uses affliction, he uses difficulty and pains so that we would realize, I have been like a deceitful bow. I've been looking for help in all these places. I've been going back to the old life. I've been trying to make deals instead of coming to God in repentance. The good news of Jesus Christ is through him, there, there was hope for Israel and there is hope for us. Regardless of the sins of our past, even if they exist to this day, if we'll be forgiven and healed, we have that in Jesus Christ. If we repent and meet his conditions. Jeremiah 4.1, he said, If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. And I love that. He says, if you will return, return to me. Like, do it now. Don't put off returning to a future date. If you're going to come to me, come to me now. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Don't go further away. Come to me. You might wonder, well, I feel so far from God. How can I find my way back to him? Well, the answer is in this passage. If we'll put away our sin, we'll confess it and repent and come to him. See, Jesus is the way. He is the way to God, the way, the truth, and the life. Turning to Jesus in faith is that first step to a new beginning, to a new life, to forgiveness. Earlier, I mentioned the tragic case of Samson. I want you to turn to Judges, chapter 16, verse 21, because I intentionally stopped short of something to share it, share with you now. Um, Judges 16, verse 21. God gives us such hope. But it's in him. It's not in our ability. It's not in our willpower. It's not in our own wisdom or experience. We need God. 
We need God for life and to live wisely. To follow Jesus, we need him. Judges 16, verse 21. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. The Holy Spirit left Samson because he had departed from the Lord. And then he, he didn't know it. It's like he was blind to it. And then the Philistines put out his eyes. So now he's physically blind. He's in chains. He's enslaved. He was as weak as any other man. Yet we have verse 22. However, the hair of his head began to grow again. It's like foreshadowing. It's letting us know that there was a return of strength coming in Samson's life, which cumulatively would be more effective at destroying the Philistine enemies than the prior 20 years of him judging Israel. He would be more effective at the end of his life than his whole, whole life to that point. Now, I don't know about you. Uh, some people's hair grows faster after shaving. There's some people that have to shave uh, once a week. There's other people that shave like two or three times a day because by 4 o'clock, you know, it's coming back pretty thick. Um, that rapid regrowth of hair, that hair slowly growing back, it's a picture of the hope of a new beginning when we turn to God in our affliction. Because there's Samson. He's blind, he's in chains, and he's grinding someone else's grain, and yet his hair begins to grow. There is now a new hope for him because he is God's. And God, he, he wanted to see him restored. Especially when we're guilty of sin. He wants us to be healed. He wants us to have restoration. Samson's pride was a cause of him falling from grace. Would pride also keep him from turning to God in his affliction? He called out to God, and God strengthened him. As long as God's people disregarded his word and went their own way, they were hopeless. They were without peace. They were without help. Their only hope for deliverance, salvation, and strength was found in God, and it's the same for us. There's forgiveness and healing and restoration for us when we repent and come to Christ, when we return to him. If you're in the shops, how, how long does it take or does it need to take for a child to be separated from their parent and to be potentially in danger? They could be in the same aisle. They could be in the same department within minutes. It, it only takes a very small lapse of focus, 10 seconds for that child to be lost. They can't see their parent. They're panicked. The parent, is a, the parent has a little, has a little bit taller, can see over the racks, and, and knows something about where their kid might be. But you know, it doesn't take long for us to wander or to forget that we need the Lord. That present gloom that overshadows you, it is often the outstretched hand of God saying, Arise, come, come to me. Will you rise at his voice? You can have your sin. You can have him. Praise the Lord that he loves us and desires our love too. Will you love him who loves you? Your sin does not love you, but God does. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we are weak and blind. We are very much like the church of Laodicea, at times where we feel like we have need of nothing, not knowing that we're naked and wretched and blind and miserable. Lord, thank you that there is hope in Jesus Christ that we can 
put on those robes of righteousness by your grace, that we can be accepted into the beloved, that we can have a hope that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for us, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard our hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've accomplished and for spreading your net over us when we have wandered from you and speaking to us even when we were stubborn and going our own way. And when we've been blind, Lord, to our weakness and our need, you've continued to pursue us. You have been so gracious and merciful and compassionate in our weak state so that we could be restored to fellowship with you. Lord, I pray that you would minister this truth to our hearts, that we would not be any more like a cake unturned or a deceitful bow or like a silly dove going to and fro looking for help where there is none. But Lord, may we come to you and trust you, throwing all of our hopes and desires upon your mercy. Lord, you are awesome, and we praise and worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.